The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies and Coat and Arms Paints. And also by the generous donations of you, the listener. Thank you to everyone for your support. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 119. Our favourite games of 2013. With Neil Shuck, Mike Hobbs and Mike Whittaker. Hello and welcome to the first Meeples and Miniatures podcast episode of 2014. Uh, my name's Neil Shook and I'm joined this evening by uh, Mike Hobbs. Hello. And Mike Whittaker. Hello. And uh, right, welcome to uh, Meeples and Miniatures, uh, especially if this is your first time uh, listening to the show. If, if so, you... where have you been? Indeed. <laughs> but... Thank you for finding us. And uh, we just say, in this show, what we're going to do, we're, we're going to look back at uh, our favourite games of last year. Now, just to say, uh, this is probably, well, this is at least the third time we've attempted to record this. So, uh, I know Mike and Mike ended up having a conversation, oh, probably about ten days ago, on a call that I struggled to join. And then we had some other technical issues when we tried to do this last week. Uh, which meant that we ended up completely changing our whole uh, uh, technical arrangement on the way we way we record this. So all of them recording Skype. We're now recording via Google Hangout, which, uh, as you may hear from the audio quality, is wonderfully clear and completely lacking in hiss. And Jake Thornton sounding like a Dalek. Indeed. So, all being well... Moving forward, uh, actually, the audio quality of the show will improve because, uh, as I say, in future, I think we're going to be using Google Plus Hangout rather than Skype for most of what we're doing when we're doing group chats, simply because audio quality-wise, it's so much better. And, of course, the other thing is is that we're in the process of changing over our, you know, what we physically record on. So uh, both mics now have uh, new microphones. Uh, mine's in the post. Uh, hasn't quite got here yet. So, at some point, you'll probably hear both of them talking a little bit like Bob Harris. So, hopefully, uh, moving forward this year, audio quality will be uh, an awful lot better. Back to the show. Let's say what we're going to be doing, we're going to be discussing our top five uh, favourite games from last year. And then we're going to have uh, just a little bit of a chat on the things that we felt were kind of main pros and cons regarding our own gaming experiences of last year or our experiences around the hobby. So that's the plan for this first show of the year. Uh, Then what we'll do moving forward, uh, the idea is, is, uh, again, in the same way uh, Mike's been... Mike Hobbs has been getting us organised, or he's getting me organised over the past few months... And so we'll be going to be doing uh, review shows where possible themed. Uh, so we might be doing like a sci-fi review show or uh, an Ancients review show or something like that. Uh, but we'll also be doing at least one show a month uh, when uh, we'll, as part of that show, we'll be discussing uh, things that have caught up in the last month in the hobby news and what we've been doing in the hobby and various other bits and pieces like that. So hopefully... Lots of different variety, and of course, we'll still be carrying on with interviews and this and the other. Hopefully, moving forward, lots of variety and different things for you to listen to this year, and hopefully, everything you know, pretty much of interest. However, trying to get you organised is like herding cats at the moment. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Which is my disclaimer to say that you trying to get all this organised may not last more than a couple of weeks. <laughs> I think that's but, hopefully, but hopefully after uh, the discovery of Google Hangout, we may actually be able to get podcast recording. Yeah. Whew, that's crazy talk. I know, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Well, as I say, all being well, we'll be, you know, I mean, come on, we've, I, I, you know, I've only been doing this for six years now, so um, <laughs> I suppose it's about time I got organised. <clears throat> Never mind, A. Eh? Right, OK, so what we'll do, uh, enough of this w- wittering on, we'll uh, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be chatting about our top five games of 2013. The Eagles have gone. Britain lies defenceless in a cruel world. Since the birth of our Lord, it has been 456 years. What sin? Have we committed to bring this punishment to Britain? I speak, of course, of the Saxons. They came as allies, but now they seek conquest. The lands of the Britons lie ravaged before them. Blood runs red in our island. We need a leader to stand against them. We need a man to bring together the Britons in common cause. We seek a Dux Britanniarum. Right, that's enough of that. Ducks Britannia are in from two fat lardies. They really are very good. So, our favourite games of 2013. What we've done, we've put together our top five games each, amalgamated that list, and so we're going to be talking about, as I say, our games, but funnily enough, some of our games uh, are common across the list, so... uh, where they appear higher in somebody else's list, we'll talk about them higher up the chain. Okay, so, I'll go first, followed by Mr. Whittaker, and then Mr. Hobbs. Okay, so first off, my number five game of 2013 is actually covered further up in somebody else's list, so we'll talk about it then. Mr. Whittaker. That'll be me. Um, so, I've been nagging Neil for the last heaven knows how long to get more board games back in Meeples and Miniatures, given that's kind of what the Meeples are for. Um, but I figured the best solution was actually to do it myself. So, my number five was, in fact, uh, my wife's Christmas present to me, which is a very nice cooperative board game called Legends of Andor. Hmm. Um, if you're um, an old-school rpg um, you, it'll it'll probably strike a chord. Basically, it's cooperative, uh, and you, your mission is basically to save the kingdom from nasty, horrible, rampaging monsters. Uh, it's also got this beautiful system where it introduces you to different game elements over the course of the first scenario. So you start off with just the basic concepts, and then there's a sort of second phase of the first scenario where you can where it starts pulling in other concepts. So it's really useful because it makes it very easy to teach to people who've not played it before, and I suspect it's supposed to be for, I think, about ages 10 and up. And my lad's had no problems with it. I suspect Neville's lad would have no problems with it. Uh, it's really, really good fun. Fundamentally, you just spend your time killing monsters and trying to work out how on earth you're going to do the scenario um, before time runs out, because they ha- it runs against the clock. And every time you kill a monster, uh, the clock advances. And every time you uh, end a day... Or you can only do so many moves in a day, the clock advances, and if the clock gets to the end before you've done the scenario, you lose. Sounds good. 
it's quite fun. Uh, lots, nice board, lots and lots of components. They get huge props. It's the first board game I think I've ever unpacked. It's the first thing that dropped out of the box was a inch and a half diameter roll of Jiffy bags. Ziploc bags, sorry. Edit. <laughs> inch and a half diameter roll of Ziploc bags. And there were actually enough to put all the components in. Which, awesome. Uh, lots of nice components. The figures are actually little card stand-up things, and I keep being tempted to go and splurge out on Reaper Minis or somewhere and replace them with, with proper little painted figures, but I have too much on my lead pile already, so that'll probably be delayed for a bit. But that's Legend of Andor. Uh, really good fun. If you want something to play with the family, it's a really nice little board game. Hmm, great. Sounds good. How about you, Mr Hobbs? My number five is um, Freebooter's Fate. Um, you be, you've been banging on about this for ages, and I, and I, st- I still haven't got a clue what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. I do tell. I think we might be doing a podcast about it in the future. I think it's on our list. Um, Indeed it is. Yeah. It is. It's it's one of my favourite games. I just really like the idea of it. It's um, a small uh, boutique game, I think is the, the, the term I use. So it's a small gang-sized game. It's pirate-based, loosely in the sort of 17th century, slyly thing, you know, it's, um, but it does involve magic and goblins and things like that. It's 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 all card based. There's no dice at all in it. It's got a bit of a, a spoof mentality when you're doing combat, whereas you basically choose the areas of the opponent's body you want to hit against, and he has to or she has to choose the areas of the body that they want to um, defend. And if you hit an area which they haven't defended, your hit goes in, and then you work out damage. Um, it's RPG lights. The figures are just. Absolutely fantastic! It's it's done by uh, a German gentleman by the name of Werner Koch. Oh yeah, superb sculptor. Oh. Yeah, and yeah. and the guy is just a genius. Multi-part metal figures. Oh, that's the only thing. If you don't like gluing fiddly bits of metal together, forget it. The figures they are a little expensive. I'll be honest. The standard figure is around about seven or eight quid, so seven eight pound for uh, it's Brits. Um, and a lot more for you Americans. Um, Having said that, that I, I, I mean, for that sort of game, especially when they come from Europe, that seems to be um, it's, it's the norm. I think the norm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even when you, even when you look back to when when Rackham were, uh, you know, yeah. were were, uh, were still up and running, uh, or a, a lot of stuff that they did for confrontation. It, I mean, okay, you know, brilliant figures, but they really were top end price at the same, you know, even even back several years ago. Mm. So it seems to be just one of those things for European games, isn't it? Yeah, um, so, you know, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but it is, it's a fantastic game. It's a just fun game to play. Little board, you know, you play on a 3x3, three three, and it's just fun. It's just pure enjoyment. So that's free boot in spade. And the figures are really pretty. The figures are fantastic. And they're, I they're keep fun. thinking of, of swiping some of them for other nefarious purposes. <laughs> I would recommend you do. They're fantastic. I must admit, I've not seen that many of them, but having said that, I, you know, I know Vern O'Clock from the stuff he's done for Reaper. Yeah. Uh, and that is, you know, some of the, again, some of the best stuff that Reaper does. Yeah, and they also do um, sort of starter sets for about, tw- I think they're like £35, which give you, you know, enough to play a game with. And I think, you know, on the side, you can actually get a, a starter, a starter, starter set, which has the rules and the cards that you need and a box of figures, and it's about €50. Euros. So it's not a big one to get into. And then you just increase as you wish. So, yeah, good game. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically seriously considering swapping a few figures for um, Legend of the High Seas. Yes, we're, we're toy, perfect for toy, that. We're toy, I'm toying with making a pirate band for, for that. So those look very tempting. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the only downside with Freeboot is, is the fact that I know I want to buy, buy myself a, a huge grade pirate ship and build a jetty and a wharf and a town and some jungle to go behind it, which is just madness. <laughs> yeah, but fun. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's our number fives. Okay, on to our number fours. Now, uh, our number fours have uh, a spoiler alert. Our number fours have a uh, have a little bit of a Star Wars theme. 
Uh, mod number four is uh, the X-Wing Miniatures game from uh, Fantasy Flight Games, which some people may remember probably this time last year when Mike and Rich Jones were talking about it in glowing terms. I was going, no, 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 no. I'm not going, I'm not going to get into that. I've got X, I've, lots of uh, die-cast X-Wing miniatures. Uh, I do not want to be getting into playing X-Wing in a completely different scale. How long did that last, Neil? About three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes... <clears throat> I appear to have, at this point in time, quite a large collection of ships. KR do uh, a very nice uh, case for uh, X-Wing, and uh, that includes, like, been off, like, 20 ships and various other bits and pieces, and uh, <coughs> I've managed to fill it this year. Uh, <laughs> Somebody we, we all have. <laughs> Indeed. Speak um, for yourselves. Look, <laughs> I have so far, so far, Mark, you resist which I can recommend it, Mike. Give it a go. I'm married to a Star Wars fanatic. It's quite an achievement, I thought. It is, is but you're missing out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you keep telling. <laughs> no, it is a, a really good game. Uh, now, I, I know Rich, if he was on the call, would be extolling the praises of uh, Star Trek Attack Wing, which use, uses a similar mechanics. And I know that came out from WizKids. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, a bit later in the year, using similar mechanics, but with um, slightly different bells and whistles. And I know some people have said that that's actually uh, more fits in with the mechanics. But I must admit, despite the fact that I'm, I'm a Star Trek nerd as well, Kel Surprise, X-Wing really hits the spot for me. It's one, been one of, the ga- uh, one of the miniatures games I've played the most of this year simply because of its accessibility. Uh, you know, it's, it's quick to set up quick to play uh, some of the accessories as well there's the uh, there's those um, like Starfield three foot square gaming mats that came out at the start of the year the figures all painted uh, especially with the releases that um, Fancy Flight did this year it basically now means that um, I'm think, I think I'm watching saying that pretty much all the at least the fighters from the original three uh, yeah, the the original and best and really only trilogy are now all covered because yeah. you, you know they've released things like you know yeah, we have the Tie Interceptor come out this year, the B wing, the A wing, um, the Tie Bomber, and so you know you're now pretty much sorted. And they're also doing the uh, the these new squadron packs, which look interesting. I think they're pretty soon. So you've got the Tie Interceptor sort of squadron pack. With special paint jobs and pilots. Uh, I'm not listening. Yes, uh, yeah, they were really nice. Uh, yeah, uh, new pilots and stuff for Time Interceptors is coming out next year. And then, of course, we get uh, yeah they announced that we're getting the big ships coming out. And uh, so we're due to have um, a Corvette, uh, which is uh, otherwise known as the Blockade Runner. There's a, a Rebel Transport coming out. And although, you know, they're going to be fairly pricey uh, it also means that the, uh, from from what I can tell they're looking at uh, a lot more scenario based stuff as opposed to I think this year they've been concentrating an awful lot on tournament play uh, but there's uh, you know I think a lot of stuff to be to do with scenarios and what have you and I know I've been I've talked a lot about looking at things like you know one of the things that I, I loved with X-Wing generally was going back to the old X-Wing and TIE Fighter computer games from LucasArts back in the day. Uh, still some of my favourite computer games. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, obviously, it's a, yeah, they were a child of their time, but for a Star Wars geek, you know, flying 30, 40 missions in, um, in, in fighters was brilliant, and converting a whole load of those sort of scenarios into actual miniatures game. You know, some of them won't work, but an awful lot of them would. So that's something I'm kind of really looking forward to. I, I know it's something I mentioned a while ago, and I just haven't got around to doing it yet, but that's kind of now on, you know, on my horizon, and especially having, with especially things like Toy Bombers coming out now. Very, very doable. Mm. Great game. Not the cheapest thing to get into. The ships are £10 a piece. The bigger ships, 
probably yeah, yeah coming off for twenty pounds a piece for things like the Millennium Falcon or the Lambda Shuttle or that sort of thing. But as you say, pre-painted. There's actually quite a bit of stuff in in the uh, in the expansion packs you get. You know, lots of cards and various other bits and pieces. So, not the cheapest thing in the world to get into. But as I say, it's all pre-painted. Punch everything out and get a game going in ten minutes. The basic rules are really easy. Fantastic fun game. Here, here. Even made it onto Will Wheaton's tabletop podcast, even if they did get the rules wrong. I was going to say, even if they did get the rules wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is the only game in our top five that's done so, so far. Mm. Mm, indeed. I'd lay pretty good odds on at least one more that might. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right, okay, so that's my number four, and um, we'll go on to the two mics. Because we got the same one. Yes, and I, and I have to be said, I, I suppose if I'd have thought about it, this is probably my number six. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this is of course the Edge of Empire RPG. Um, for those of you who caught the um, what should we call it peripheral activity to the podcast last year. <laughs> yes, a summer break. Um, Meeple's on the edge. Yes, Meeple's on the edge, uh, which I think is where I got roped into this madness. We were playing Fantasy Flight's uh, Edge of Empire, which is. Actually, it's one of the best RPGs I've played in a while. I love the system. It's one of these systems that, that does lend itself to being very fluid, very easy to play. Um, the dice mechanics are interesting, but surprisingly effective. Um, and some good written scenarios. It was great fun. It was, yeah. I mean, we were lucky we had a, a damn fine GM running the game for us. Hopefully, Richard, as you listen to this, Rich, you were superb. Um, it was, it, was, it was brilliant fun. Uh, um, Stonking. Yes. The uh, the whole thing of, I mean, again, go back and listen to Meeples in the Edge, but spoiler alert. When players go off piste and do things completely unexpected and the system could just copes with it, you know, with the fact that there was a, attempting to uh, attempted to take on part of a Stormtrooper Legion by nicking a, you know, by nicking a shuttle, and u- a Lambda shuttle and using it as a ground attack aircraft. Hey, don't knock it, it works! <laughs> well, yes, don't knock it, it works, but um, <laughs> yes, I, I mean, that has to be one of my gaming highlights of the year, if not the Oh year. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Even if it did, be, get, did get me into dreadful t- trouble for coming to bed very late. Yeah. <laughs> Mine was about ten minutes later when we rammed the other group who were coming towards us because I just had enough by then and I wanted to go to bed <laughs> so... <laughs> yes. it was great fun but I've got it to fight a... yeah <laughs> yeah. but the mechanics the mechanics the... and if you've got a good GM who can take you down blind alleyways and bring you back to the story possibly then it's a super and that's a very cute it does and there's also more. one for Google Hangouts as well yeah, Rich sorted out. If you're listening. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, that was that was something we did on Skype and I think Rich mentioned, Oh yeah, this should probably be this will probably be better on, on Google Hangout. There's some of the extra extra options that Google Hangout gives you. Uh, again, it becomes an ideal online RPG tool, doesn't it? Yeah, we we had um, a, a second game with Rich, uh, myself and a couple of guys down here in South Wales. We played it on Google Hangouts easier, but of course we were, it ended up being chased by a criminal gang, and just general nastiness happened. We need to learn how to be subtle. <laughs> Never gonna happen. Yes, I don't think subtlety is quite and, a strong uh, point. Yeah, we, we, we tried to do a very quiet break-in halfway up some tower, and just ended up taking our muster building. It didn't help that I was playing a slightly irate um, droid with lots of guns. <laughs> and I kept shouting death to the fleshy ones. Uh, yes, I can, imagine, I, can, I can imagine just how that went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I mean, the interesting thing with Edge of the Empire, of course, is that although, you know, all you really need is the basic rulebook, 
um, Fantasy Flight seem to be going overboard with the amount of stuff they're producing for the actual game at the moment, aren't they? You, you know, you've got all sorts of different bits and bits and pieces coming out for it. Yeah, I mean, I have to play. Um, I think they got the new supplement out. I think it's out already, isn't it? The second one. Um, uh, it's it's but, out in beta. Is it in beta? Is it? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the rule book is fantastic. <laughs> the rule book is just worth buying if you're a Star Wars fan. And let's face it, if you're the kind of sad holder of classic RPGs like me and have a stack of um, original West End Star Wars role-playing game scenarios, they're probably shoot audible in Page of Empire without too much trouble. Oh, yes. Okay, so that's um, Mike and Mike's number four, Edge of Empire. Okay, let's move on to our number threes. I believe that mine and uh, Mr. Whittaker's number three are the same. Certainly are. And that is, of course, Dreadball. It's your turn to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> I'll just get win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Dreadball is probably now what? A, just over a year old. Um, it, so it, it came out last Christmas after a... A completely mental Kickstarter. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, and it's one of uh, two or three that have gone quite mental for uh, for Mantic. And, I mean, I'll be talking about another one pretty soon. But, uh, yes, Dreadball, uh, over the space of a year, they have come out now with uh, 12 teams, lots of extra bits and pieces. Uh, I, but let's take one step back. If you're not aware of what Dreadball is... Dreadball is a sci-fi sports game based in the Mantic Warpath universe, and it's probably, uh, I think Jake describes it as almost a little bit like ice hockey. I still don't believe that he'd never heard of speedball, Appar- but apparently the first time people played it and they were saying, hey, this is just like speedball, uh, which is an old... Uh, classic computer game uh, he had no idea what people were talking about but it's just like playing the old speedball computer game except with miniatures I, I think they have done a pretty good job in actually putting this whole package together ok as far as the shipping and various other bits and pieces are concerned I've had a few issues, but as far as the game is concerned, fantastic set of mechanics, very, very playable. The thing that really appealed to me is that, especially having just gone through a Blood Bowl League at a club and it being painful, uh, especially with newbies, to, to go through Blood Bowl, coming on to Dread Bowl, so much easier to play. S- uh, an easier set of mechanics, a much quicker game to play, much more dynamic, and um, at the same time, you know, just huge amounts of fun. And they moved the game on an awful lot in the space of a year. As I say, we've now got 12 teams available. Uh, they're already talking about a new Kickstarter this year for what is effectively Season 4, which is called Dread Ball Extreme. Uh, but they got they produced some really nice figures for it. I think my favourite figures are the Terratons. <laughs> it has to be said. Um, well, well, you can't you can't go wrong with teleporting turtles, Kim. Indeed not, and and especially with if nothing else, I yeah I went a bit mad with Dribble, and and and, and I've got m- most most things for it. And the casualty figure for uh, for the Terraton is just superb because it's a turtle on its back with just feet and a little snout sticking out of a shell really <laughs> it's, it's just absolutely brilliant but of course you know you got things like uh, you know they've introduced new rules throughout the year for things like coaches and what have you and you, you start getting teratons which are like turtles and of course one of the coaches happens to be a giant rat and so you got you know all that sort of things you know so despite the fact it's a sci-fi thing you've got the whole like you know teenage mutant doing the turtle stuff going on and and loads of different things flying around but 
bottom line, it's a really clever game. Some of the teams, it's been argued, are uh, a little bit overpowered in non-league play. Uh, I think the Judd one especially have uh, that potential issue. I know uh, at the start uh, there was some question on game balance uh, with the Forge Fathers, which I think has basically been addressed. There are some issues. I mean, for example, uh, well, I think mostly saying, ad- mostly addressed by Jake saying learn to play them properly. Well, um, quite. It's yeah, one, of the, one of the key things about Dreadball is that all the teams you need to get the right playing style to do well with the team. If you're the kind of person who just wants to just smash into everybody, for God's sake, don't play the Juddle one. And conversely, um, if you like flinging a ball, flinging the ball around, um, the Terratons are not, not a good choice either. No, no. But uh, yeah, it is one of those things that you, you certainly have to. Play the style that your that your team is is designed to play with, rather than trying to adapt your team to the style that you want to play. Yeah, I, I got that... I got lucky in that I I didn't um, do the Kickstarter. I actually had it sitting there with with a fairly sizable pledge um, and bottled out um, at the end of about a day before the, the Kickstarter was due to finish. I thought, I've probably got defaults given how much I've spent on Kickstarters already. Um, and I actually just picked up a Void Sirens team um, not much more than, what, two months ago? Um, yeah. And I got lucky in that it just really, really suits my style of play. Um, I, I, I quite enjoy um, a more sort of open throw it around game, and it seems to work quite well with the Void Sirens. And, and I, I, I probably wouldn't, if I'd picked, picked the, the Orcs, it probably wouldn't have got on at all. But I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I think with things like yeah, opposed dice rolls and just so just the way a lot of the mechanics work, um, and yeah, we see uh, you know we see adaptions of this in some of the other stuff that Jake's done, and we'll, I'll be talking about that in, in, uh, a bit later on tonight. Uh, but uh, just super fun. And the mechanics work really well. As I say, I think the, there are a couple of issues with things like, for example, the way that leagues run. Uh, I think it's been highlighted that there are potential issues around it, like it, there's just not enough money floating around the various other bits and pieces. Having said that, you know, I think Jake's done his best to address those issues and suggest fixes and different ways of doing things. So. Over the space of a year, I think it's certainly been a very interactive process in uh, you know, the way the game has moved on. And uh, again, I suppose it's one of those things that at least it shows that you know, there is, uh, yeah, there's quite a big community out there, isn't there, Mike? It does appear to be. Um, I'm looking forward to playing in a league down our club this next few months, so I will, I will report back on, on the balance of the league play. Um, the other thing I would I would echo is that, that Jake Thornton does not design a good game. He's he's got a, a real knack for making game mechanics work with each other, and it hasn't yet. Although I can see how it might, it hasn't yet fallen over the horrible multiple interacting special case rules falling over in a heap problem that things like Flames of War have. Mm. Yes, and. You don't get the same confusion, in my experience, that you do with a, uh, even a game such as Blood Bowl. Um, you know, I, I mean, as I say, Dreadball so much quicker to play. In my experience, it's very it can, it, it can be quite difficult to get a game of Blood Bowl completed in under a couple of hours. Yeah, we got three games of four-player ultimate in three hours the other Monday, which you never do with Blood Bowl. Oh, that's quite impressive, aren't <laughs> <That's good. laughs> And I want to. Yeah, good stuff. Right. Okay, so I think we've hopped on enough about Dribble. Um, but yeah, yes, superb game, well worth checking out if you haven't done so already. And uh, as I say, there is a new season coming out in, um, <clears throat> in 2014. Quite interesting, actually. Some people have actually turned around and said. Oh, I'm not going to Dreadball because there's been too much stuff come out too quickly for it. Which I found was an interesting comment. 
you know, I mean, I mean, for me, at least it's it's, it's a case of well, hang on, they produced all this stuff in the, managed to produce all this stuff in the space of a year, so it gives lot people lots of choice in what they do. And on top of that, they've just brought out a new supplement which was not produced by the Kickstarter. But if you saw that. Oh yeah, there's this new um, there's this new thing about dribble around, dribble around the galaxy thing. Around the galaxy, yes, and the first one's yeah. in the jungle. Yes, yes, I'm, I, yeah, I'm the. It's got a couple of new MVPs and um, a few different ways of playing. Yeah, that looks quite uh, interesting. That looks that looks great fun actually. I'm curious to see how that how that plays out. I'm sure that somebody will turn up down no club with a copy of it sooner or later. It's a bit of a strange comment about pe- you say people saying too much coming out at the same time. Because we've had the same thing with Saga. And that's why, that's part of the reason why we completely delayed doing the next supplement. Because people say, they, they, you know, it's, it's too much. It's, it's an odd concept to me. You know, I remember the days when you used to buy a, a, a supplement which had like a couple of hundred different army lists in there that you could use. So. Yeah, quite. Maybe just yeah. a tension fan. <laughs> Yeah, it's always been in the past that people are always chomping at the bit. You know, when's this next thing coming out? When's that next thing coming out? And all of a sudden, you kind of go, "Well, okay, there it is." Hmm. You, you have a game, and people want to go, "Oh, what? Okay, now what do I do now?" Then, well, the thing is, kids, you don't have to buy everything. You don't? No, funny. Oh. <laughs> That's oh. what I've been told. <laughs> I don't believe in myself. It's just you know, it's a, like some old old geezer on the club. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> That'll never catch on. <laughs> the, thing that's actually, the other thing that's just cropped up, if if nobody's noticed this, there's now a couple of third parties producing custom pitches. I know there was there was the um, the vacuum formed stadium that that Nantic have been promoting, but there's the guys at fffields dot com who are also producing custom printed dreadball pitches. If you want one to match your team. Oh, oh, oh no! I noticed that. Oh. Oh, they've, uh, I have ordered one, and it looks really, really pretty. It should be arriving in the next couple of days. Oh, what? You'll have to send me a link. In the show notes, folks. Right. Okay. Okay, well, let's move on. Mr. Hobbs. Well, my number three is actually um, coming out a little bit higher in, in the charts, so we're back. Right. Okay, then. It's over. In, yes, we'll come to my number two, which is uh, the other Jane Thornton designed game in my top five. <laughs> <laughs> um, and funnily enough, uh, well, it's Dead Zone, which is uh, another Mantic Kickstarter uh, from last year. Came out before Christmas, and uh, I think this was uh, back in May. And again, using several ideas and mechanics that uh, had come up in. Uh, Dreadball, but moved in, in, in a slightly different direction, and now using a mix of wargaming and board gaming ideas in a, quite a small restricted area for a tactical wargame. So the basic game is based on a two two foot by two foot board. The, the board's divided into th- into three inch grids. So there's actually very little measuring involved because it's all you know all all, all the measurement and everything is done on squares. So again, based in the Warpath universe because it's Mantic, the base game is designed around using uh, effectively special forces type uh, you know type squads if you like. Um, one of these, uh, as Mike would deem. Boutique games in the fact of in the fact of actually yeah you, you've actually got a small force that you are using, but the big thing with Mantic are doing as well is that they were pushing as well as the actual game itself they were pushing uh, new scenery being produced in plastic and a uh, whole load of stuff again one of these kickstarters that went absolutely mental I must admit I haven't done my homework and checked how much the Kickstarter actually raised, but it was it, it was a lot. Uh, it went very mental you know, towards the end. Lots of stuff produced for it. The thing that struck me was, well, first off, during the actual Kickstarter itself, Jake came out with the beta rules. So we got to play the game before the Kickstarter was finished. And, again, 
great concept works really well and I immediately saw that actually this has got potential outside of the game itself for converting to use uh, say with other figures for example so rather than using horrors only mantic figures okay just use it as a generic sci-fi skirmish game the mechanics should work really well in that environment because of what they did with the Kickstarter, they've expanded the rules slightly. So rather than just working on a two uh, on a two foot by two foot board, they've expanded it so it will work up to about a four foot by four foot. One of the great things they did, and this is something again because it's a it's a similar sort of thing to uh, what Mike mentioned with uh, the Dreadball Ultimate pitch. They produced uh, a, a deluxe gaming mat. Which um, is kind of this kind of like mouse map material, uh, rather than just like a you know a, a a paper gridded map if you like. So you've got a printed kind of two foot by two foot mouse mat, effectively, as your gaming board, and they're brilliant, absolutely fantastic. So I just got into the base game, but bought four of these mats because you know you could use them as uh, just your gaming mat for. Yeah, any kind of urban sci-fi environment that you're working in. And they're great. The figures, yeah, fine. Nicely produced, you know, generally pretty good. Uh, the scenery, um, <clears throat> it's good and, I mean, in some ways it kind of reminds me of a, a little bit of uh, the old Necromunda, st- uh, the old Necromunda stuff, except the fact that everything's plastic you know, it's a lot more uh, versatile. They've talked a lot about the fact that you can pull it all apart and pull it back together in different... Uh, well, you can build things in different ways. I'm not overly, confu- uh, uh, overly convinced that that will work in the long term simply because I think some of the components, perhaps, especially some of the connectors, perhaps aren't strong enough to quite cope with that. Uh, yeah, you know, several times of pulling apart and stuff I think you're going to start breaking things because they're plastic and I also don't like the way that Mantic kind of sold the whole arena thing because when you look at their layouts they don't look like buildings they look like paintball arenas now I know that's a yeah, that's like a semantic thing for for me, and just, just well, an, a, an aesthetic thing. But actually, I you know I I much p- prefer playing over things that look like buildings as opposed to things that just look like bits of buildings put together to make barricades and that sort of stuff. But that's simply that's the direction that Mantic went down. I'll do things a bit differently from a gaming system point of view and the way the game works. Brilliant. And I can see it being flexible, and um, I think it's going to be my go-to skirmish game as far as sci-fi is concerned. So I'm really happy with Dead Zone. Uh, I think it's got, you know, uh, I'm quite happy with where it, where we are, with what's produced for it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm now quite happy that I've got everything I need to then take it into into other directions. I must admit, I've I've had a look at it down uh, down the shop. Apparently, it's, it's been selling very well, you know, from from big sort of shops. And yeah. um, I, I know that Rob, who who runs Firestorm, turned around and basically went, you know, this is the first Manta game that actually is actually of a, of a good quality. Yeah, you know, he said. Although apparently the the box is too big by a uh, Royal Mail, but that's another thing. Mine, but came, I, mine I, came by UPS, so yes, that doesn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's huge. It's <laughs> massive. I I, I will yeah. per- be perfectly honest. I have, I, unlike unlike Dreadball, I did do the Dead Zone Kickstarter um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I did like the look of the game. <laughs> I really, really want the scenery because um, I suspect it will be a great addition to things like Judge Dredd. Mm. Um, 
And I also quite fancied the figures just per se as figures. Uh, of course, I could designs on a bunch of other sci-fi skirmishy things, and also I suspect they work well for something like Sedition Wars Battle for Alabaster, which I've also got to Kickstarter. But I haven't actually opened the box bar checking it's there yet. Um, I haven't <laughs> had time. <laughs> okay. But again, it appears to have another outbreak of Jake Thornton writing really clever game mechanics in it, from what I can tell from having a scheme of the, the PDF of the rules. Yes, I mean, as I say, I, I mean, I was really impressed with the whole process for Dead Zone. I mean, um, if people managed to struggle through listening to episode 118, where I, I talked to Jake, and uh, I, I know a, a lot of people said it was basically, you know, not very listenable. So apologies if if you tried and failed. Uh, that but, was Jake. I thought it was a Dalek. <laughs> Yes, I think it was at some point. At I, I, I did. I did actually manage manage to get through it. In fact, I, I just finished listening to it today. Um, very interesting interview. If it's, it repays listening to, actually, I learned quite a lot. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, just looking at you know, I mean, that thing you're yeah, talking about the way Jake designed it, but just the, the whole process with. Uh, the way they went through the alpha and the beta, uh, uh, the beta testing, you know, very, very public, very, very responsive to what was going on. Jake did a brilliant job with it, just, you know, you know, just from that sort of things. And then getting the whole thing produced. I played several games of it this year. Funny enough, since I've actually had the Kickstarter, I haven't played a game since I've actually had the official stuff. It's all been on the stuff that we created from the from the beta rules and everything was where I played. And using things like um yeah, you know, using you know old GW figures and various other bit and uh buildings that I actually created from the old Necromunda scenery and various other bits and pieces. But yeah, I think it's uh you know, it's a really good system and uh I'm looking forward to playing playing it a lot this year. Okay, so that's my number two, Dead Zone. Mr. Whittaker. Ah, my number two, which I think is also Hobbsy's number three, unless I miss my guess, is it the is indeed rather excellent Judge Dread, uh, which cover be about a month ago, something like that, before you went off on one of the long natter with Jake Thornton over about eight pod- podcasts. I like to think of it as the classic series of, uh, of the podcasts. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. Um, Judge Dredd. Um, what can you say? It's another of Mr. Hobbs's lovely um, boutique games, I think is the, best was, is the term we coined for it. Um, I mean, we could just say, go back and listen to the podcast, but I think the key thing, the key takeaways that have picked up uh, since then are the second edition of The Rules is now out. Uh, in a rather nice looking it's a lovely looking hardback and they they do seem to have ironed out an awful lot of the kinks and and what one of our club members describes as the cheese those places where you produce an army list and go god that's sick they seem to have got rid of most of those which is good and warlord are now putting out figures at a rate of knots they are sometimes um, even before mongoose get them, which is a little na- uh, naughty. But there you go. Maybe we can discuss that later. <laughs> but it's a fantastic game. You know, it plays well. It just captures the the whole idea of the of the comic, which is important. The new rule book is well worth picking up. Even though I've got the original book and the old book and the, the free rule book, and I think I've got the original 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 rule book. Yeah. But but they're all good. It's you know it, it's been through a couple of years of sort of lying fairly fallow with, with mongoose whilst they try to get it together. The kickstart has been quite interesting, but I I can only see good things for it now. No, I think I think they they made a very good call dealing with warlord. Uh, allows mongoose to get on with the things they do well, and warlord to get along on with the things they do well, uh, and and it's a bit of a no brainer really. Uh, and as you say, it what it does really well is you get pretty quickly immersed into the world, into the setting. If you didn't grow up with 2018, where were you? If if you're all at all familiar with Judge Dredd, the setting, uh, this does it. End of. Yeah. Uh, there's a few dodgy sculpts from the old days, but the new ones which are coming out are, are lovely. Yep. You know, uh, I think Gary Morley's been doing quite a few nice sculpts. 
Stephen May's done a few. Um, you know, they're they're good stuff. So yeah, very future I think for for Judge Dredd. The other thing they've, they've tweaked a little bit with second edition is it doesn't go quite so um, rapidly non-linear as you've got levels. Um, we played a we, we've had a campaign going down the club with with the first set of rules, and it was getting a little bit. Uh, it's getting a bit like a little bit like playing high level D and D, in that people are quite seriously hard to kill. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, we, we're about to reboot with with second edition, I believe, on Monday. So I'll be quite interested to see how that works out. So I shall continue playing my bunch of bunch of psychopathic female judges. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, all good sir. Okay, great. And uh, finally, Mr. Hobbs, your number two, which happens to be, if you can remember that far back, my number five. And because I've talked a lot on this show, I'll let you talk about this. Thanks so much. Uh, right, my number two um, is Empire of the Dead by Westwind. Mm. Um, yeah, I think Neil's done um, a interview with Andy back in the day. I don't know if we've ever really properly reviewed the rules, though. Have we? I think, oh, I'm trying to remember, yeah, I think I did a, a review of the rules after the interview. Hmm. But anyway, it's um, um, yet a... But we haven't, well, certainly we haven't talked about it amongst us, I'm just, I, I, think, no. I think that was a kind of a bit of a solo thing. Yeah, yeah, it was probably back in the day before. Yeah, um, Empire of the Dead, so it's Victorian Gothic horror, it's another one of these um, boutique games, copyright M. Um, Hobbs. It's RPG light again, you have a small gang of your characters, they go off, fight other gangs, get stuff, there's a campaign system built into it. The figures are just, again, fantastic. You know, Andy is just a great sculptor for just capturing mm. the, the feel of sort of Victorian, not so much steampunky, sci-fi stuff, but it's just, it, it's it's very, it's sort of based on the books, I think. He, 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 he brings the characters in from the books. So they're not, you know, massively over-equipped with odd stuff. They've just got a little kink to them. But they're clean, really clean figures, and a joy to paint. The game system is is simple. It works really well. It's quick. And I love it. I love everything about it. I've got, you know, I, I like Neil, went in quite heavily on the Kickstarter. So I've got enough, you know, when you only need six figures to play a game, I have got a couple of hundred probably. <laughs> Um, <coughs> yes. <coughs> yeah. Yes. I, I mean, it, it has to be said that uh, the one thing that I think really put Empire of the Dead on, on the map this year was the Requiem Kickstarter that, that they did. Yes. Before then, uh, they had a limited number of figures available. They had the five, well, they had four starter box sets. They had a box of Victorian zombies, and then they had. Ooh, uh, probably about a dozen character figures. Yeah. And then this year. The Requiem Kickstarter went. They were, they originally said, "Okay, we're going to be uh, producing our second wave, which was about eighty figures." Plus, they planned on doing several carriages. Mm. They ended up producing over double that, didn't they? Yeah, it was a hideous amount. He was just drawing the concept art as he was going on, and some of the, the limited edition figures in there are fantastic, really nice. Um, yeah, it's I, I, I've got it all in a box. It arrived all together on time, you know, beautifully packaged, you know, it wasn't just thrown into, into Jiffy bags, it's all blistered, so no breakages. Everything labelled, you knew what everything was. <laughs> yeah, it was a joy, an absolute joy to unpack. Um, but the rules, the rules are solid, They're really, really solid, and the Requiem rules have been released now to the Kickstarter. I've had a quick look at them, there's rules in there for using carriages and games, which are quite interesting. We've obviously got the new uh, um, factions in there. There is a little bit of discussion because there's some characters in the Requiem rules that we don't have figures for. Likewise, there's some figures that have been produced which we don't have rules for. But I think that will iron out. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's anything. I, I'm I'm now actually looking at it, thinking right. I I I now want to do a a Victorian Call of Cthulhu type campaign based around London and the country and get you know a couple of my mates playing there and basically have them racing around the country picking up clues trying to you know capture or track down them um, great uncle Tao 
who was one of the uh, characters in there, mm. who looks remarkably like a great old one, wearing the top hat and smoking a cigar. So, Empire of the Dead, fantastic, just buy it. You know, yeah, sim- it, simple it, as that. Uh, yeah, I, I think, to my mind, probably one of the best run Kickstarters I've been involved in. Yes, definitely. Despite only making about a tenth of what Dead Zone did. Indeed, yeah. Ni- um, 92k as opposed to 1,216k in dollars. Yeah, yeah but, but simply from an organisation point of view, the way they were responsive to, to people and, and just the way they got everything planned out, it was an incredibly well organised and well run. Uh, it was a joy to be in that particular project which others have been a little bit frustrating and well yeah not exactly the most pleasant of experiences in some of them but Empire of the Dead fantastically well run Mm. and as I say you know when when Mike was saying it ended up in the case of at times Andy was basically running, running concept art overnight designing figures because he suddenly went oh we need something new and you know coming out with stuff and various other bits and pieces you know it caught them by surprise I mean they were oh going, yeah I think yeah. I think it did so much better than what they ever thought it would do yeah I think they, they, they were after was it 30k something like that yeah and it just went on and hang I mean, on I've got it here somewhere <laughs> The other good thing about uh, Empire of the Dead, a little bit of um, slight self-promotion, although I've done very little of it, um, there's a really good army builder site out there called um, Empire of the Dead, which is written by a guy called um, Greg. I've given him a little bit of hand adding in some of the new stuff, and we're going to be pushing through and adding in all the extra factions fairly soon when I get a bit of time to actually import them into the software. Um, but that's really good because you, you can use that to build your group you can arm, you know, you can, it's got all the weapon types in there, it takes control of how much money you've got, and at the end, you just plug in what happened in that game, and it basically works out what's happened. You know, it works out, it tracks the wounds that you've taken, it tracks, you know, how much money you've got, what you've got to spend in the next game, and it's a, a really good bit of software. And it's free. Yeah, uh, the Kickstarter over overachieved massively. They were after five thousand quid. They made ninety two thousand. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and w- well deserved. And you know, it delivered on time. I think it was about a month late. Is that? No, uh, no. I think it, I think it ended up slipping a couple. Uh, ended up slipping a couple mm-hmm. months. And, and 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 the other thing was, I think it took them the best part of two and a half months to actually get everything shipped. So some people were waiting a while. Um, now, they decided to ship in a particular way. They basically went from the smallest to the largest orders, which meant that some people who had got on the early birds, for example, didn't get their uh, their orders for, se- you know, for several weeks before the people did. And funnily enough, that was something that they took on board and said, OK, we're going to do that differently for our next Kickstarter and stuff like this. Hmm. The one thing they didn't say at the time which I only found out because I spoke to Wendy separately. Now, they did do an, uh, now they did do an interview post the, uh, um, post the Kickstarter, and it's now out there. But while all this was going on, you know, they had a major family issue where um, Wendy's dad fell off a ladder and broke his neck. And, all, and so there was a huge family problem going on. Obviously, you know, West Wind are a, fa- are, are, are a family business. I think there's, uh, well, there's Andy and Wendy, and I think they've got two other guys working for them. And, you know, they had a major family tragedy going on during the summer. Mm. And yet, kept things going as far as the business was concerned. So, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at what they did yeah yeah all things considered yeah a lot of people would have basically turned around and said look okay you know i'm sorry but we've got you know yeah we've got a real life problem and we just need to put things on hold 
which you know undoubtedly, what, going uh, undoubtedly would have caused an awful a, a subset of the backers to go, never mind that, I want my figures now. Well, exactly. And the thing was, they just never did it. They just got on with it and didn't tell any, it only came out later. And and you look at what, you know, and okay, there was a there was a bit of grumbling about slippage. At the same time, you, t- you see, you talk about slippage, you know, they the dates were based on producing 80 figures. And plus, you know, a dozen vehicles. And they ended up sculpting twice as many figures. Yeah, there's a lot. And, and stuff like this. So, you know, there's the Kickstarter went massively well. And yes, there was, so there was a little bit of slippage. But they even catered with that really well, kept everybody informed on what was going on. Then and, and points turned around and said, OK, yeah, we realise we made a mistake, we won't do that again, really sorry. Just, they were just brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I've, got, I've got an awful lot of respect for Andy and Wendy. I think just generally Westwind have been, uh, you know, they're, they are a great company to deal with. And, uh, you know, really friendly, you know, f- really friendly couple anyway. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're a fantastic couple and a business to deal with. And, uh, you know, I'm really, really, really impressed with them. So there we go. That's um, Empire of the Dead. That's Empire of the Dead. And yeah. so we come to our number one game from, 2000, uh, from 2013. And, strangely... For once, we've for all once, agreed. We've all agreed. And our number, one, and our number one game is all the same. It is. I wonder what you think it can, I wonder what you think it can be. Do you want to have a break before we tell them? The Meeples and Ministers podcast is very happy to be sponsored by Coat Arms Paints. Now, Coat Arms have been supporting miniatures painters with their products for well over 20 years in some way, shape or form. Their current range is 150 sets of acrylic paint, which are available both as individual colours, but also in paint sets depending on period. Things such as the Ancients paint set, the World War II German, World War II American... World War II Russian paint sets and they also include things like an ACW set and even a horse town set that's one way to purchase your paints and they also do triads now if you're a fan of the three colour system made famous by the likes of people like Kevin Dallimore you may like to purchase your paints with a dark shade a medium shade and a highlight and the triad system from Coat Arms allows you to do this they also have ranges of textured paints called Brushscape, which allow you to paint from the textures onto bases as well as colour. And these are ideal especially for smaller scale models. And if you're a fan of the dip method of painting, then Coat Arms have their own product available called Super Shader. This is available in light brown, dark brown and black. Coat Arms paints have a whole range of products available to try. Check them out at www.blackhat.co.uk and be sure to tell them that we sent you. Yes, our number one game is, of course, Chain of Command. Yes. Yes. Right, next, what, what should we talk about now then? <laughs> well, it does say, I mean, it has to be said, we have said quite a bit about Chain of Command this year, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously there was a thing that myself and Mike got invited down to Lard Island to, uh, during the uh, the final testings of the rules and got, and, and got, and got to play for a day. And uh, I've promised that I wouldn't mention it again, so I won't mention certain incidents uh, because they are well documented on, 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 other, on other episodes of the podcast but com- conversely, we had- conversely we had Rich up to our club um, to demo it which was also quite useful from a point of view of getting your head around the system Yeah, it is surprisingly easy to learn despite some people's protestations to the contrary uh, it's got a very nice force generation system uh, which does use points let's be honest about this just in a slightly clever way. Um, 
and it is by far and away, as I think I'm without fear of contradiction going to say, the best World War Two skirmish game out there. Yes. 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 And, um, and for for those of you who were remembering comments from the episode where we reviewed it, I now have a Home Guard force, uh, which got an outing at All Games Blog Gone, um, and is about to start in a chain of command campaign. <laughs> Note the <laughs> chain of command campaign supplement, which is called The Sharp End, is coming out real soon now. Um, it's about Indeed. to go into proofreading, I believe. Yes, yes. Uh, yes I, I must admit, I'm one of our next shows. I'm hoping to get Mr. Clark onto the show to talk about both that and also the upcoming Raiders supplement for Ducks Batani Armand. Oh yes, please. Uh, which is another game that we haven't kind of really talked about, which was which is really good for the year, but it's kind of been squeezed out by a few of the bits well, and pieces. Ducks Ducks came out last year, um, twenty twelve. Let's face yeah. it. If I'd well, yeah, you. but even so, it, it, even so, I mean, you know, we're not talking about necessarily about games that came out this year. We're talking about our favourite games of the year. But uh, you know, so it doesn't oh. have to be stuff that came out this year. Are you? Were we? Oh, I'd have put Ducks Brain if I don't. Oh, well, there we go. Well, it's too late in my chips until next year. Yes. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but yes, um, so hopefully I'll be uh, say, talking to Rich really soon about uh, uh, about the sharp end, amongst other things. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, fantastic set of rules. And in, rather interestingly enough, other companies with uh, other very popular skirmish rules um, have been producing suppl- uh, you know, army supplements for purchase um, over the space. I mean, you know, very well supported set of rules, lots of stuff produced. Do you mean bolt action Not- or warlord? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but okay, yes, bolt action. Have you know? Warlord are doing a fantastic job of supporting bolt action from that side of things, and you know, yeah, lots yeah. of stuff. The thing is with uh, Two Fat Lard is that, is that they have decided to offer all their supplements as free downloads, which is an interesting commercial decision because I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure they could go along with what they've done, what other companies do, uh, and you know, Warlord are not the only ones that you know, if you come to different supplements for. Uh, different army lists, yeah, that, that's going to cost you. But instead, they're offering everything for free. You know, whether it's early war uh, for you know uh, Germans, Poles, Brits, and French, whether it's Russo-Finnish, or even think uh, uh, they're doing a, a Spanish Civil War at the moment, aren't they? That's yeah, actually now finished. Uh, it was basically sort of a 12 Days of Christmas thing, and they've basically produced every conceivable army list for the Spanish Civil War. Um, that's plus it. And, a and, few and, extra. And, and, I'm trying so hard not to look at that. I, I, I'm resisting very yeah. hard. Because the thing is, I mean, because what they've done is that because of the way they produced it, you not only get just the army list, but you get a lot of background involved in it as well, don't you? So, you know, so uh, as like your starter for 10 for the Spanish Civil War, even if you just downloaded all, even if you just downloaded all the army lists, you get a fairly decent background into the whole camp, you know, the whole war in itself, don't you? It's a very well put together bit of research. I think uh, the two guys who did it is... Rolf uh, um, and... Uh, Blanky, or the other guy's name. Neil? Or Could Joe? Be. Apologies, yeah, we're, 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 we're hanging together by we're, we're gonna pray here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but I've had a little read through because I've always wanted to do Spanish Civil War it's always been one of those on the fringe I mean yeah my mate Bill uh, Fornil from Musketeer Miniatures um, about five years ago tried to get me into Spanish Civil War and we looked at the figures by um, sorry blank again we looked at by we look at some figures uh, which have now been bought by Empress Miniatures, um, and they're fantastic. But we just couldn't find a decent set of rules. But Chain of Command is the set of rules for Spanish Civil War. It's it's perfect for it. So I'm going to try very hard not to look at the Spanish Civil War supplement in too much detail, because that way it does lead madness, and I will spend a fortune. 
Spanish Civil War seems to have been a thing, isn't it, over the past year or so, because we saw a set of rules come out from Osprey for them. There's been another set of rules come out, which I can't for the life of me remember the name of. But I'm sure I've seen another set of Spanish Civil War rules come out this year as well. And then obviously we now get this, uh, we, you know, we now get all these supplements for mm. uh, for China Command. I, I think it's the, the 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 period is interesting historically. It was definitely a prelude, obviously, to, to World War Two, but it's it's small scale. It's you can play it with, you know, a a T twenty six is a major battle tank, you know. So people who like the smaller scale, lighter armor, you know, maybe people get, have got fed up of playing the big cats in 1945. People sort of said tactically, there's more interest in playing early war stuff. You know, like, like yourself, Mike, doing doing the home guard stuff. You know, when you've got to play a game where y- y- you're not armor heavy, it makes you mm. feel, especially World War Two, and. You know, and there's the Spanish Civil War. There was an interest in you know, the Irish War of, of um, Independence, which was 26, I believe, 1926. And also, sort of the um, maybe it, it's a bit from the uh, the very British Civil War, which was very years ago, and you know, he still continued to be yeah. popular. And there's another game that would be great in in China. Uh, a friend of mine is actually running it. Yeah. Um, he's been he's been working yeah. out how to do it, and he's been looking at the COC Espana stuff with with considerable interest from that point of view. It's also a measure, I think, of how good the core system for chain of command is. That the necessary extra rules for chain for chain of command Espana are fundamentally to do with types of unit that just don't exist in World War Two. Um, there's a few extra rules for cavalry. There's a few extra tables for off-table machine gun fire support, which really isn't something that happened in World War Two. And, and the whole Coque Espana ex- extra rules set is a princely five pages long, and that's it. And then, of course, you've got all the army lists, and they all have that little quote national characteristics thing, which is one of the nice things about Chain of Command, and has been produced without this whole conflicting multiple special case rule thing that besets things like Flames of War and I suspect Bolt Action um, and of course it's on free yeah now, whether that's the right decision commercially I don't know I mean it, it's very nice getting stuff for free but sometimes you think if you put that much research into stuff wrap it up in a PDF and charge somebody a couple of quid you know at least you'll get something back for your time but there's also the point that the Lardies, okay, so they have got some 20 mil figures uh, for Chain of Command up on their website, but fundamentally they're not a build figures business or, or um, even plastic soldier company, let's face it. Uh, they're in the making rules because the rules are good um, business. This is probably something that we um, could debate some, <laughs> probably after, the, yeah, forever. <laughs> I was going to say next. <laughs> yeah. Down the pub. <laughs> yeah, there are figure manufacturers who will produce a set of rules to sell figures. There's also all games. <clears throat> there's also figure manufacturers who produce figures to supplement a set of rules, and it's t- sometimes it, it can be quite hard to find the, the distinction between the two. I prefer the the, the latter. I prefer yes. a good set of rules that supplements a a a, a set of figures. I, I don't like rules that are there just to sell figures. Well, it's, it's easy to tell, isn't it? At the yeah. point where your tournament stops you bringing figures in for other manufacturers, dot, dot, dot. Or talking about them on your forum, yeah. What? No, never happened. You don't do it on Saga. <laughs> no, indeed. Um, no. I think Saga. one of, the, one of the, the nice things about um, Chain of Command is it's reasonably basing agnostic. Um, so if you have figures ostensibly based for some other 28 mil or even 15 mil skirmish system, um, or twi- you're laughing. Or 20 mil. Or 20, yes. Other scale figure scales are available. <laughs> um, then um, you're, you're, you're laughing because there isn't really, as such, a, a, a basing basing requirement for chain of command. Just just pick up your figures and go, which which I love. Yeah. I just it just just makes life so much easier. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, I've well, I think people have got sick of me waxing on about Channel Command. Um, I think it's, I think Rich has used one of my quotes that uh, on a couple of the adverts, adverts that he's put out, basically because you know I've basically turned around in in my reviews and said it's the best skirmish game that I've played in twenty years. You know, and I'm. That's it for me. It is absolutely superb. You, you can't say any more than, than that. It, it is. It's a fantastic set of rules. Well done um, to Rich, Nick, everybody involved in producing the game. You've done well. And just keep it coming. Yeah. Sell more stuff, though, guys. Honestly, you, yes. des- you deserve it. You earned it. Yeah. <laughs> certainly. Certainly, yeah. yeah. I think I, yeah, I'm, I'm good at that. But, yes. Yes, unanimously and all very well deserved our favourite game of last year, China Command. Brilliant. Yeah, go out and buy it. You will not regret it, seriously. Brilliant. Okay, so that's our list of um, our top five. Was there anything that just missed your list, guys? Yeah, any any kind of, you know, um, honourable mentions you want to make? Well, Ducks Britanniorum, obviously. I've played an awful lot of that last this past year. Um, mm-hmm. And I've been having a massively fun, self-indulgent time doing campaign write-ups on my blog. Um, and I still think it's, it's it's probably the go-to system for me for Dark Ages by a long shot. The other one I would add uh, that I had Ooh. one... That's, that's, that's fighting to it, Mr. Hobbs, on the... On the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can. Who? Uh, yeah, please, please, please note. I'm I'm about 500 years back from Saga with Dux Brit. I really like Dux Brit. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic <laughs> game. If I did, it, it, it is a fantastic game. If I didn't play uh, Saga, I wouldn't play Dux Brit. Uh, and the other thing that I think merits an honourable mention. I only played it once, and I had an absolute barrel of loss with it. Was in Her Majesty's name. I've never played it. I've, I've seen it on the shelves. I, I'm going to pick it up. Another of the Osprey, um, or you could almost call it pocket war games, um, given mm. it's one of the smaller book sized books. Um, it's a pretty much, it is another of these boutique war games. It's sort of Victorian. Mm. Um, a real fun game playing um, uh, against a bunch of wacky cultists with a force including Inspector Lestrade and Sherlock Holmes. I have an absolute barrel of laughs. It's a nice, easy system to learn. Uh, and it's really good fun. And there's some really nice figures out there by um, North Star. I think Scott there are some Steve really, really nice Steve figures Seller. out there. Steve Seller, yeah. Yeah, yeah so Seller. lovely. Uh, rather interestingly, uh, having talked about Empire of the Dead, uh, I mean, I've, okay, I've got to get in Her Majesty's name. I'm, I've not played a game of it. The interesting thing with looking at the figures for uh, the, uh, that Northstar have produced is that they do air more on the steampunk end of the uh, VSF genre, whereas Empire of the Dead is much more gothic horror. Uh, so it's, yes, it's quite interesting yes. looking at compare and contrast between uh, the way that just, just, yeah, the look and feel of the figures. Okay. So, despite the fact that you know they are two games essentially based in exactly the same uh, you know in exactly the same period of time, their look at uh, you know the actual look and design is actually quite different. Yeah, it's also worth it, if you look at those figs because I'm I haven't picked up any of the um, Majesty in Her Majesty's name figures. Um, I, I want to have a little look and see how how well they fit in with the Westworld ones. I imagine they might they might be a bit chunky because Steve Salad has sent the scope a bit more sort of chunky, shall we say? Um, yeah. But I'd be interested to have a look at them. But there's another set of figures as well um, produced by um, a firm local uh, to me here in South Wales called um, Ironclad Miniatures, um, oh. and he, he's been producing those for about five or six years, even before you know steampunk became popular. And again, nice figures, well worth picking up and having a look at. So there's lots of ranges out there. I think they fit in with in Her Majesty's name quite well. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's my two bubbling unders for this week's chart. <laughs> I think the only one I've got is um, the Battle Group World War Two rules. Um, uh, yes, um, Curse uh, called yeah, Overlord. I, yeah, I, I, yes, I'd second that one. Yeah, Overlord and Fall of the Right came out this year. Yeah, I played Overlord a couple of times now. Fall of the Right, yeah, it's on the radar to do. They're just great. They're really good set of rules. 
you know, and they've uh, definitely capturing. And I, I think Mike, you say said a, a little while ago that a lot of guys on your club who used to play Flames of War are now playing Battle Group. Yeah, that's correct. The the there is does seem to be an awful lot of mm, dropping Flames of War like the proverbial hot potato in favour of Battle Group. And some real serious Flames of War diehards in our club who are they're now moving over to to Battle Group. I'm slightly puzzled. I don't quite understand why they're selling off whole Flames of War armies to do it, I admit, but what can you do? <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I'm sorry that, that makes no sense whatsoever. It makes no sense to me either, mate, but I have seen people advertising whole big Flames of War, you know, custom-designed Flames of War, mini-max with an inch of their lives, um, armies yeah. beautifully painted. I think I, I, they've decided that this is such a horrendously historically unbalanced force that maybe they'd finally see the light. Oh, it's well, possible. Maybe. Yeah, but but all you do is just change your you know just oh uh, yeah. I mean, having said oh, having said that, uh, they may have decided to go twenty mil rather than fifteen mil. But no, I'm sorry, no, no, no they haven't. I, I, it's all I, fifteen mil still. I don't understand. In that case, then, I just don't, I, I don't understand. Uh, I have successfully I, reduced Neil to stuttering apoplexy. I'm very happy. Well, quite. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and of course, yeah, this is, I think, this... I don't, I, I'm desperately trying not to get pulled into a, a thing here, but see, this is the thing that gets me with... At, at times when you have, you know, people who... Well, no, people are so used to having things like, for example, okay, you know, I have a game, you know, I, I play 40k, therefore I've got a 40k army, okay? And if I go to play another system, I can't play my 40k army in that other system. Yeah, and sometimes I'm, that works, sometimes that doesn't. I know exactly you know, what you mean. That doesn't work in that doesn't work with Flames of War because Flames of War is World War Two. However, certain people still have that Games Workshop mentality. Yeah. That okay, I can't use my I can't use my Flames of War army with another set of rules. Maybe well, they, why not? Maybe they just I mean trying to play devil's advocate and trying to see the senses because I used to play Flames of War and I've kept all my armies and I have played in lots of different rule sets. But anyway. Maybe it's a case of they looked at the number of figures you need for a platoon in, in battle group and worked mm-hmm. out that the figures didn't match up. So they they, they might have thought, well, we, we can't use that infantry platoon because... What God? Well, you know, maybe they just... I'm just trying to get into the head. Maybe they're just having, okay, they, in a Flames of War platoon, it's got X number of figures and there's five to a base, whereas in battle group I need to have you know, six and three in a squad, so therefore it doesn't match up. So I either rebase or I buy new. Well, I can't use those then. And then we'll look at the the um, vehicles we've got. Well, I can only really use three or four of these vehicles, so the rest I can't use. So is it a case of, you know, to to get a new army, I can use so little from the, this this army that exists, which is probably worth quite a bit of money because it is, as you say, balanced for flames of war and would sell as a whole. Fully you know, painted, five hundred. Fully painted, yeah. But if if they takes out, if if that pl- player takes out a couple of tanks and some half the infantry, would it be worth four hundred pounds, or would it suddenly be worth a hell of a lot less? So maybe they just think, I'm, I'll start again. That's the only thing I'm I can think loss. of. Yeah, I'm at a loss. I'm completely yeah. at a loss. I have to say that I have quite considerable forces for another World Two system, uh, namely I ain't been shot on. They're only for that in that that's the system I play rather than anything else. I'm sure they can be used for, for Battle Group Curse or Battle Group Overlord without any loss of generality, but most of them are made by Battlefront. Most of my own is a Battlefront. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I do actually like Battlefront the way that they, they put their, their, their figures together. You know, I, I like so do I. I. You know, I can buy a platoon in a blister and all the figures are there. I don't have to. Not only that, but the more recent sculpts. Or really oh. lend themselves to the um, um, base base coat plus ink highlight ink wash. They're just yeah. nicely deep deep enough cut that you can yeah. get enough ink in to do an ink an ink style highlighting for them. And I really I just finished assembling a, a British platoon, uh, late war British infantry, and they they inked really really nicely, covered up mm. an awful lot of grotty painting on my part. Yeah. <laughs> but this did feed into something Neil said a while ago is. You've got all of these 
rule systems for World War Two, and all of the platoon makeup is different. Yes. A part of that, to be fair, is because some people go with T O and E, um, and some people go with typical World War ty- typical in the field levels yeah. of troops. If you look at, I think you find Flames of War go with U S involves, or was it? I think. Uh, Twelve, and, yeah. Yeah, I ain't been shot, Mum. Suggest tens because that's about where you got to with typical in field in, in the field attrition. Uh, I don't know where battle group battle group overlord fits in that gap, but um, I think they're tens as well. I'd have to go and, yeah. go and look it up. Yeah. Me and Neil Woods had a very strong argument about this whole this whole thing of is it TOE or is it what's in the field and, and what should the rules show. I don't, I, I don't think I don't think it was that strong argument. Uh, an argument. I was just, I, I was just venting for. Frustra- I think I was just venting frustration at the fact of, oh for goodness sake, if I wanted to build an army and use mm. use it in multiple systems, how the heck you know how the heck can I put my my army together when you've got several systems mm. which are looking at the same conflict and yet we pull things in different ways. But flames I mean, of war doesn't care because you take things away by base. Yeah. And I ain't been shot, one doesn't care, because you, even if your figures, you, you, you effectively base per platoon, and if you count casualties, when you get down to the, the number that there should, when, when, when the number of the unit drops to zero, take the bases off. It really doesn't matter if the figures don't quite match the number. You, you, you can get up, you can do it, it's not a problem. You, you can only do it anyway just by putting little markers and little dice on the, on the bases. Um, Strangely enough, yeah. yeah, there's lots of ways around it. Hmm. Absolutely, yeah. That was a digression and a half, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and as I say, we got, we got slightly sidetracked on that one. Uh, so, Mike, is that is that your only is that your only honourable mention for for last year? Yeah, I haven't played as much as I wanted to, and the most stuff I've been playing has been funny enough, Chain of Command, Emperor of the Dead, Judge Dread, and Freebooters. All right, okay. Uh, I've got. Couple more honorable mentions to make. I mean, if okay, if you want to go out, outside of the realms of miniatures, I've been playing a lot of Magic this year. I just say that quite quietly. What with cards and things? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> my sons, uh, my sons got into Magic, and um, I didn't want to go down the whole collectible side of things because it was just you know I just don't want to go there. Yeah, you know, it's a money pit, but. I've been playing dual decks and actually just from a system point of view and actually the game I've been, I've been really enjoying it you know I thought, um you know I'm I'm actually quite I actually quite like it but I can see how it can become a complete money pit so I've stepped away from that uh, but I've really enjoyed that um the other game from a miniatures point of view is uh, I've got some mortals which was the latest uh, set of Osprey rules to come out. Uh, these are from Andreas Filigoy, uh, who is the guy who produces uh, all the uh, Song, of, Song of Blades and Heroes rules uh, and you know Song of, Drums, uh, you know, Song of Drums and Shackos and various other bits and pieces, based on the same uh, uh, the same rules engine, but this time. Uh, using things like uh, its uh, gods, mythic creatures, and then men from different uh, uh, from different mythos, and then putting them in pitch battle. So you've got things like so you can have things like the Celtic gods and the Norse gods and the Egyptian gods with war bands fighting each other. So what size game is it, Neil? Is it a, um, well, a skirmish game with about fifty figures or less than that? Uh, no, it's, um, it's 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 probably uh, well, it's, it's it's kind of warband size. So I mean, you, you're probably looking um, twenty, thirty figures. Hmm, that's something like that. That's quite big because Songs Blades and Heroes normally is about ten figures, ten twelve figures. Ten figures, yeah, hmm. yeah. Uh, well, basically, what you've got, you see, you you've got individ- uh, you've got individual units because you, you've got gods and heroes. And I think what they call legends, which are individual figures, and then you have, um, un- uh, but then rather than individual figures, you have units, which are either four or eight figures. 
in a unit. Oh, okay. Uh, but what you, uh, but as I say, it, it, the way it works is because you have gods on the field, uh, and that they're represented by uh, effectively like avatars, if you like, then they draw their power from the uh, the mortals who are fighting in their army. So if you you start running out of mortals, then all of a sudden you know you lo- the god starts losing worshippers, and then ha- struggles to stay uh, 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 struggles to stay stay in his corporeal state and stuff like this. It's it's got some nice little twists and turns in it, but it was just just a lovely idea um, for and you know for me it was like okay well I've got some. Um, you know, I've got some Greek figures flying, uh, lying around, and I and I've got Vikings from Saga, and uh, I've got some. Uh, I think I've got some Egyptians floating around here, there. But it was like, okay, so I can actually just pull together and make a war band out of these figures I've got floating around, and you can put a game together without again, you know quite cheaply hmm. and there you go and it's it is a fun game and I do like the Song of Blades and Heroes system uh, I, I mean they, uh, it's, it's just another one for Osprey which is coming out next, um, later on this year called um, um, A Fistful of Kung Fu which is a kind of you know Hong Kong action movie sort of uh, uh, sort of rules again using exactly the same engine and because of the way that the engine works, and you know, there's an awful lot of kind of kind of uh, special attributes involved in the way that you design particular creatures and uh, and what have you. That's the way the system. It, you know, it, it's like a universal mechanic, and then you can uh, just overlay different special rules. Yeah, cause and it works really well. He did do a game using units. Before I guess the ACW game sixty one sixty five, sixty one sixty five. Yeah, because yes. that was you. You get like a half company, don't you? So it's it's units yeah. of about six or eight men together. So that's yeah. it. And and the and there's a there's a um, songs of drums songs songs of drums and shakos large battles. Yeah, uh, does a similar thing as well. Um, again, that came out subsequent to sixty one sixty five. Mm. The game system is solid, and I, I like you know it's. I just lo- I just like the way it works. Um, it's got an it's got a nice interactive turn mechanic, and yeah, uh, it was just uh, a game that really appealed to me. And yeah, we had a game of this down our club um, back in November. Uh, admittedly, mm-hmm. this was um, two days after I'd been out from, out from under a general anaesthetic, so I probably wasn't in the best state to do it justice. But I really like the core mechanic. The the, the activation dice game is really quite clever, mm-hmm. and it was a good fun game. Um, I, we did seem to spend an awful lot of time hunting up rules in the book. I'm not, which didn't seem particularly brilliantly indexed. Now, I'm not sure how much of that was just that none of us were particularly familiar with it. Um, but it did seem quite hard to find some of the rules. But uh, no, that is uh, that 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 is one issue. Right, good. It's not just me then. Um, but I, I quite find it. It's got sort of little saga style touches where you have ranges are short, medium, or long, um, mm. which which is quite sweet. Um, I like the the whole invocation thing where you can your mortals can give your god more activation dice by 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 praying to him. Uh, and if your god gets killed, your mortals can can pray to have him have his avatar brought back, uh, which is quite cute. Um, it was good fun. Yeah, it seems very very fluid. That was the other observation I had, uh, because the setup rules do not constrain you greatly about who sets up where. Uh, you don't seem to get much of the way battle lines, and it all tends to, to, did seem to get very very fluid with people charging each other madly all over the shop. Um, but good fun. Uh, I'll let's play it again sometime. Definitely what to look out for. Okay, so that was 2013. Uh, so, what are we looking forward to this year, guys? More chain of command, obviously. Mm. Gary down our club has now put together a force of early war Germans, um, and we're probably going to be using the new at sharp end rules to do a little bit of um, invasion of Britain, formed with my home guard. Um, 
probably using some scenario ideas from Andy Johnson's Zalo and Nord book, which is I won't spoil the the uh, the, the, the plot twists and as, as to where the Germans turn up. But it's oh, quite. Is, a, it, uh, is that the uh, the IMB Shopman supplement? No, 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 no. It's a what if novel. Um, oh, okay. Um, he's advertised it quite heavily on Twitter, um, and it's really actually quite fun. It's one of the, it's, it's it's a bit, bit ripping yarny, but there's loads of potential for pulling some really nice chain of command scenarios out out of that. Um, which is promising to be fun. Um, they have foolishly made me chairman of Peterborough War Games Club, so I've probably got a whole bunch of all day games and demo games to organise for that, so that'll probably keep me quite busy. Uh, we're looking at doing some stuff for D Day, 70th anniversary, which will probably include one of the really quite um, brutal I Ain't Been Shotman scenarios based on Omaha Beach, um, which is going to involve some terrain building and stuff. And I have promised that this year I am actually going to finish some of those boxes of Napoleon at War figures that I've got sitting around. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Oh, and the other thing, of course, is that there'll be about a kilogram of lead turning up on my doorstep when my Winter War Kickstarter stuff arrives. <laughs> ah, right, OK, you got involved in that, did you? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I wanted to get involved in that. I, I was in a, nearly to the end when a £800 MOT bill landed on my lap. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm gutted. Um, well, unfortunately, that means I'll have a whole load more terrain tiles to make all covered with snow. White sheet, mate. Get a white sheet and just just do with some space and just chuck it over. It works a treat. Uh, right, for me, he says, now being organised. The things I've got on my radar is I'm waiting for the um, All Quiet on the Martian Front Kickstarter stuff to arrive. Oh yes, I'd f- yes, yeah. yes, yes. That was that was one of the podcasts that never was. We reco- <laughs> we must have recorded at least two versions of a podcast on, on or quite on the Martian front, and it, yes, it, it, it wasn't very good. It, yeah, note to ourselves is don't try and record a, po- a podcast over four different lights covering four different things because you end up talking about the same thing four different times <laughs> without realizing Indeed. it. Yes, and it was it was it, it was not there. So yeah. so in the end, in the end, I turned around to Mike and said, "Look, let's let's just yeah. let's just ditch this, and and we'll talk about and we'll talk about it when your figures arrive." <laughs> I, I looked at it and gave it some quite serious thought, uh, and mm. sorry if I wasn't sure about the scale or necessarily some of the um, some of the figure designs, and I definitely wasn't sure about the price. Yeah, and no, I I think I got quite a good deal with it. It was. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it coming out. They've they've, they've uh, released some good updates. Uh, I think the plastics are just about to be made now. Um, mm-hmm. uh, they've, they've they've shown pictures of them packing up the metal and stuff, and there's just piles and piles and bags of metal. Um, so it, it's getting close now, which is good. Chain of command wise, obviously that's going to continue. I'm very tempted to do something around early war, possibly Eighth Army. Um, just looking at some of the plastic by the Perrys, and but they are nice. Yeah, and and just mainly because I've got a whole thing about Vickers light tanks, I'm just out an excuse to use a Vickers light tank or two. So, I think early early uh, Eighth Army would, would do that quite nicely. Didn't the Finns use those as well? Uh, did they? I they, believe they they used something that looked very like it. They used the T twenty six a lot. Yeah, I don't think they, they might use Vickers. I thought there was something. I seem to remember some comments on the Winter War Kickstarter that some of the sculpts were going to be slightly made slightly easier by the fact that some things borrowed heavily from the Vickers. I may be mistaken. In which case, Neil can edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> or, just sure it in. Will. Yes. or just leave it in and prove I'm an idiot. No. Yeah, so I mean, that's the thing I want to do for Chain of Command. I'm going to definitely keep uh, Spanish Civil War at an arm's length um, because I don't have the terrain for it which is my main concern now when it comes to games if I haven't got terrain I'm not playing it I take it you've been following the um, battle reports that Rich has been putting up for the 8th Army stuff on Lard Island blog yeah um, I also fo- uh, followed the one he had on Twitter which was um, 18th century naval landing on a on an island somewhere was a tremendous fun 
So I, I don't know what that. Uh, yeah, it was a couple of days ago on Twitter. Um, so I don't know what he was doing. It didn't. It, it looked too big a scale for Chain of Command. It had boats in it. He pasted this whole thing on on Twitter every couple of minutes. Just picked. Yeah. So the, um, Rich posted this um, this game report on Twitter, um, which was a bunch of naval. Um, soups and looks like um, island and island assaults and I'm not sure what it was I, I didn't recognise the rules, it was definitely too big for Chain of Command it might have been sort of sharp practice it was sharp practice? well, well it, it, that's the only thing I could think of it was sharp practice-esque or maybe it was, yeah. uh, maybe he's working on something else in the background you know what Rich is oh. like, he, he, he plays around yes. and um, comes up with great rules, so that looked good. And uh, anyway, the, the only other thing I'm looking at is um, uh, six mil sort of sci-fi games. There's a, a new game coming out pretty soon called Polyversal, which looks... Oh, yes, Mr. Wa- yes, Mr. Whitehurst. Yes, which looks very interesting. Mm. Generic six mil. So I've been I've been dusting off my um, my epic armies and then looking at those and looking at that, uh, an old set of rules called Net Epic. And thinking, I want to play this again. Not forgetting, yes, of course, course, that if you've got that, you, you can use Squadron 13. Exactly, yeah. Yes, hoping mm. to get Ken on the show. That'd be great. Yeah, because they look really interesting. Mm. That would be cool, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good stuff. So that's me for this year. Oh, obviously, that'll change next week. Well, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a similar sort of thing with me. I mean, at the moment, at the moment, I'm, at the moment, I'm kind of saying, okay, right, I've still got, um, I'm still promising that I'm going to do my 15 mil World War Two armies, uh, and I'm going to be playing that with both Iron Bean Shopman and Chain of Command because I decided I'm doing Chain of Command in 15 mil, not 28. Okay, um, <clears throat> rebel that I am. Uh, obviously, we've got Dead Zone, and using that with. Uh, uh, I, I'm, this year I, I'm kind of thinking I, I might be going quite sci-fi rather than historical for a change uh, I've got lots of uh, lots of little kind of uh, groups of sci-fi figures uh, whether it's, it's Cobblestone or whether it's a whole bunch of stuff from Hassle Free you know, the, the, the Hassle Free Grim um, or I've got a, uh, I've got a, a, a Vaser Force some i and uh, I want to get a whole load of uh, uh, I've been promising myself for several years now to get uh, the Pig Iron Sci-Fi Infantry. Uh, they got two or three sets, and and they and, and they are. Just, I, I've got some tanks, but their Sci-Fi Infantry is really nice. Yeah, they are. They're some lovely ones. Yeah. So I was kind of think uh, what what I wanted to do was get those, and uh, then maybe use them either in Dead Zone or use them. Basically, look at things like the. Uh, a, a lot of the stuff for, for the you know the uh, the modern force on force scenario books yeah convert those to use the scenarios with tomorrow's war that and 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 use those sort of figures mm. so i've got all sorts of thoughts like that going on, going on in the back of me. i mean how how much of, how much of this is pie in the sky <laughs> you know me well i you know. um also actually have some 50 mil sci-fi plans but um i'll talk about those in a bit because um, they, right. they 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 most they do involve doing a bit of writing work first to design a setting, uh, right. uh, and then uh, finding uh, some actually... figures that will work. <laughs> right. Okay. And the last thing uh, I'm kind of thinking. I, I mean, there's you know there's the uh, uh, obviously looking at maybe doing some more saga and because uh, uh, I, I haven't played saga for a while. I want to get back to playing a bit of saga and stuff. And the last thing, of course, is. Um, uh, Acton Cthulhu the miniatures game. Yeah, I'm trying to ignore that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely figures were produced for the Acton Cthulhu uh, Kickstarter, and uh, over uh, Christmas, um, Modifius uh, Chris Birch Modifius announced that, that he teamed up with Spartan Games. Uh, they were using the rules produced for Dystopian Legions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. which are very uh, good set of rules 
Yes, uh, I remember you and Rich talk, uh, uh, talking about them, well, probably about this time last year, actually, yeah. um, uh, about Dystopian Legions, and they're going to use those sort of rules for Acton Cthulhu, the miniatures game. Yeah, that'll work. So that's what. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Mm. And that's exactly why I'm not going to look at it. Mm. Damn, I've got the train. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... That's about. Oh, I think. I think that's about it, then, guys. <laughs> okay. Well, so we've talked about uh, our favourite games for 2013, and uh, we've talked about a little bit about what we're looking forward to. I'm sure there's an awful lot more we can talk about, and uh, we have a whole section on uh, what we found good and bad about last year, which uh, we decided that we weren't going to go into because that's a long discussion in itself and uh, as uh, as Mr Whittaker said there are libel uh, well I wouldn't go, I wouldn't quite go that far but especially you know, once you start mentioning um, the word kickstarter um, there's a whole host of stuff and um, oh actually that reminds, that reminds me one of the things I'm looking forward to in 2014 and I'm sure Mike is looking forward to this as well um, battle systems oh yeah yeah. Yes, more scenery. Mm. I resist. I was very good. I resisted. You resisted? Oh, oh no, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was bad. I didn't. I didn't. I thought Judge Dredd. <laughs> yeah, and I thought Dead Zone and loads of other, and Space Hulk and other sci fi stuff. And kind of went, yeah, that that would be, be really cool. So. Uh, yes, so uh, I mean, again, and actually, I, I will. I would all suggest is that this is Mr. Ho- Mr. Hobbs's fault from a conversation we had earlier in the year, where Mike turned around and said, "What you got to do? You got to concentrate on the games that you've got scenery for." So um, I'm concentrating on the games I've got scenery for, and uh, I, w- I would note that what he didn't say was what you should do is go and out and buy more scenery so you can play more games. Uh, not as such, but uh, that that appears to be the upshot of what's happened. But at least it means now that, especially with all, especially with all the it. dead zone stuff. I can now do sci-fi inside and out, so we've got interior and exterior. So you know, it's all it, you know, it's all it, you know. I'm I'm kind of thinking it's all kind of matching in some way, shape, or form. You just buy any way you want, mate. <laughs> Indeed. <clears throat> anyway, so at some what point, a- yeah, we're happy. As long as you're happy, we're happy. Right. Does it need? Pay- uh, no, it's pre pre. Uh, it's 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 uh, it, it it comes pre- it comes print it comes printed full color. Mm. Only assembly need only only assembly required. No painting, which has got to be a plus. If you've seen the stuff that yeah, if, if you've seen the stuff that Terraclips did a while ago for Malifaux, it's a similar sort of idea to that. But yeah, I actually, well, I had I had a long look at the Kickstarter and. and, and decided not to yield to temptation yeah I yielded I, I yielded big time yeah but there's no surprise there is it no no <laughs> anyway so let's bring this thing into land and just say <laughs> say so you know as I say uh, the, we've got a whole other show we, we can talk about um uh, uh, yeah, what we thought was good and bad about 2013, and I'm sure we'll come back to that uh, in a roundtable discussion in the not too distant future. But as you can always gather, even from you know, our discussions that we got, oh yes, we got an idea to do this, to you know, to to to, to talk to uh, uh, Rich Clark, to have Ken Whitehurst on the show. Uh, we've got a whole ho- we've got a list as long as your arm of stuff to review. And obviously, you know, the hobby is moving on at a fair pace. So there's lots and lots of stuff to, for us to talk about this year. And uh, especially now we've proven that uh, the technology on the whole works, especially when I remember to plug my laptop in. Um, so uh, I think, uh, well, all being well as far as uh, you, the listener, is concerned, uh, we should be in for uh, a bumper year with Meeples and Miniatures. 
so I just want to say uh, thank you to Mike and Mike for joining me. You're welcome. Uh, indeed. And uh, look forward to uh, look forward to chatting an awful lot more this year. And uh, uh, I promise I won't l- leave you alone while I go hobnobbing off on interviews too much. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. So, all that's left to say is uh, thank you uh, once again for listening. I, I hope you've uh, enjoyed the show, and um, we'll talk. Well, hopefully, we'll get a- another show in a couple of weeks or so. Uh, not quite sure exactly what we're doing yet. Um, we said we were organised, but um, yeah, we're not that organised. <laughs> so, until next time. Thanks very much for listening. Take care, and we'll speak to you really soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you want to know more about Meeples and Miniatures, there are several things you can do. First of all, you can visit the website at www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. If you want to contact the show at all, you can email me at neil at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk You can follow the show on Twitter. Simply look for M&M Podcast or click the Follow Us on Twitter button from the website. We also have a group on Facebook. That's the Meeples and Miniatures Podcast Fan Club. Again, follow the link from the website. And finally, if you want to help us to support the show, you can always donate to the podcast by clicking the PayPal button on the donate page, again, found on the website. Once again, thank you for listening. I hope you've really enjoyed the show. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.